Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of the Bad Philosopher Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Levesque, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about mountains and philosophy, and maybe even the philosophy of mountains. I don't know, something along those lines. What I'm trying to do here is get to a more sort of embodied philosophy. And what do I mean by that? I mean, well, as human beings, we have bodies. And sometimes when we do philosophy, we sit back in our armchairs and just sort of think and theorize and hypothesize about things. That's not really how philosophy should be done exclusively. And sure, there's a time and place for that, especially when we want to get to some sort of theoretical insights about the nature of reality or some exotic thing like that. But Today, we don't really want to do that. Today, we want to talk about more practical things, more worldly things. I want to talk about mountains and mountaineering, and specifically, what draws people to the mountains? What draws people to climb mountains, to be in mountains, to move through mountains? This is an open question that I want to attempt to get at, and we'll see how far we get here. For my part in this today, I do want to talk about some experiences I've had trekking in mountains. Specifically, I want to talk about a few close calls that I've had and the lessons that I've learned from those close calls. And these lessons themselves don't just apply to mountaineering, they apply to life in general. And this way, I think we can sort of define what embodied philosophy looks like. It's this idea that we have these experiences in the world, say, these experiences I've had of close calls in the mountains, and we've learned something from those experiences. We've had something that we've taken away, some sort of insight, something to work on. And with those lessons, if they're good lessons, then they're also things that we can apply to other areas of our lives too. So with that, I just want to jump straight into it. I've got three mountaineering stories to share, and three lessons along with those stories. And those lessons can also be applied to our everyday lives. So the first sort of close call I had in the mountains was something that happened on Vancouver Island while I was hiking up in Strathcona Park. At this point, I was getting really into longer hikes and endurance sports in general. I was really into running. I was fairly fit. I felt pretty invincible. I hadn't ever had like a close call or a bad experience while out on a hike or anything like that. On this particular trek, um, going into Strathcona, we had a 10-kilometer hike into a backcountry campsite. Once there, the plan was to spend the night, and then on the next morning we would go on a 6-kilometer hike up to a mountaintop, and then 6 kilometers back down, and then pack up everything and hike out the 10 kilometers to the parking lot on that same day. So all in all, it was two days of hiking of about 32 kilometers spread out over rough terrain, Carrying heavy packs were a good part of that, and then some uphill sections that were more strenuous going up the actual mountain where we didn't carry heavy packs but had lighter packs. So the mountain we were going up was called Mount Albert Edward. It's 2,093 meters in elevation, and it's the sixth tallest mountain on Vancouver Island. There are quite a few mountains around this size. I mean, the tallest mountain on the island is only another 100 meters taller, so quite a few mountains in this area that are approximately the same height. Unfortunately, I did start out fairly unprepared. Like I said, I was feeling very invincible at this stage. I didn't have any waterproof gear at all. I didn't have a waterproof jacket. I remember at the trailhead when we were about to start off, we were also starting off a little bit later in the day too. I think it was like afternoon at some time. It looked like some bad weather was rolling in, and a park ranger actually saw us going in and asked us if we were prepared, if we had rain gear and all that, to which we responded, yeah, um, my friends, the two people that I was with, they did have rain jackets, but I did not have anything. So the hike itself up to the first campsite was long, but fairly uneventful. We got to our campsite and it was pretty dead there. I think there was only like one or two other groups of people. It was also a weekday, so... I think during the weekend it had been pretty busy, but then the weekday it really calmed down. On the next morning after camping, we got up and we started our hike up to the top of the mountain. And it was a super cloudy and drizzly day with a lot of fog and a lot of mist. After some really steep uphill up this really steep path, we got to the top of this ridge that then led to the mountaintop up to Mount Albert Edward. 
And up here is along this exposed ridge is where we got hit with some pretty crazy wind and rain. It was, I think, the gnarliest I'd ever seen up until this point. The rain was going completely sideways with the wind blowing up against us. And here I got completely soaked through because I didn't have any proper gear at all. I think I was even wearing like jeans and a cotton sweater or something like that. But at the stage, this didn't really slow us down or anything. We just kind of kept on going, navigating through some intense fog. We were in clouds, basically, so navigation was actually really hard and visibility was incredibly low, which ended up being a pretty bad situation to be in because there was a lot of exposed rock faces and a lot of drop-offs with big cliffs. So as we're kind of walking around navigating, we have to be careful that we don't step off the ledge of a cliff or something like that. You gotta be watching your feet, watching where you're going. As we went up higher in elevation along this ridge towards the summit, we began getting colder and colder, and it was windier and windier. The weather was pretty bad. My friends did have some waterproof, rainproof gear, but they were also wearing shorts and they were getting really cold. And I was in pants, but not waterproof stuff at all. I was soaking wet, and I was really feeling the chill here, though at this point, keeping moving was really keeping me warm. So at one point up on this ridge, we were navigating through this intense fog through what seemed like a barren wasteland. No matter what direction you looked, it was just rocks and boulders strewn out across this expanse of this ridge, and you couldn't see very far in either direction. It just felt like you were in some foggy box or something. And here, the only way we knew that we were heading in the right direction towards the summit was by following the cairns, these piles of rocks that sort of marked the way forward. And the fog here was so thick that we could barely see the next cairn ahead of us each time we reached one. We also had no idea how much further we had left to go because we couldn't see the summit at all, and we didn't exactly know how far we had come at that point. At one point we reached a big patch of snow and ice that was near a ledge, and we couldn't see the summit and had no idea how far away we were from the top. We sort of stopped here and decided to get our bearings and eat a snack, drink some water, and consider whether we should continue or not given how difficult the conditions were. And here, this is where stopping actually did us in. Since we were all totally soaked and it was a terrible cold day, the, the cold was actually pretty unbearable, we all started feeling really cold and started shivering at this point. And with the wind chill on our wet bodies, it seemed like all of us were having trouble thinking about what to do next. One of my friends wanted to continue on to the summit, and the other did not. I was sort of in the middle, and I ended up being the deciding factor. I decided that for safety reasons, it would be best to turn around, to turn back and head back down the mountain, rather than risk going any further, not knowing how much further there was to go, and not being confident in our ability to safely navigate. But also, the deciding factor for me was definitely the cold. I mean, hypothermia can happen when you're wet, and we were all soaked. Even my friends with rain jackets had gotten wet from the sideways rain. We also ended up convincing our other friend to come back down with us by saying that the weather is so incredibly bad that even if we got to the summit, we wouldn't have a view of anything at all. We'd still just be boxed in by the fog. So with that thought, we turned around and we headed down. This is the point where the cold hit us all really, really hard. So coming up this mountain that was kind of steep and we're pushing the pace and we're kind of huffing a bit, your body really warms up and you don't really notice how cold it is out there. But once you stop and rest and your body cools down and you've got a little bit of sweat on you and a lot of rain, you're soaked through. And then going down the mountain, which isn't strenuous at all, you're not working up your body heat, you really start to feel that cold on the way down. I remember feeling very numb, especially my hands and my feet, and sort of just marching on back down the mountain through the fog on what felt like a bit of a death march. It seemed to take forever to retrace our steps through the exposed rock faces and make our way back down. I think we barely even said a word to each other at all most of the way down. It was enough mental effort just to keep on going. All in all, this wasn't a particularly strenuous hike either. I mean, my body wasn't physically too tired. I was just extremely cold and unprepared, and the conditions in these alpine environments can change so rapidly. And I mean, this is exactly how you get into trouble. At one point on our way back down, we lost the cairns. We couldn't find the path down. 
We continued following what we thought might be a path, but after about 10 to 15 minutes, we realized that we hadn't come up this way and we were going in a completely different direction from the way we came up. So at this point, we had to kind of stop and get our bearings a bit. Since since we had come down into a bit of a more treed area, we luckily were less exposed to the cold and the rain and the wind, and we could regain our physical composure a little bit. Visibility was still pretty bad here. We debated whether we should follow this path and see where it ended up and hope that it took us back to our campsite. But in the end, we ended up making the right choice. We decided that we'd be better off turning around, heading back up the mountain a little bit and looking for the cairns that should mark the rocky path we needed to take down. So we did that. So we got to the spot that we had lost the cairns and began looking around. The fog was so dense that we lost each other in the fog, but We actually maintained contact by yelling back and forth. I think we were doing Marco Polo, like yelling Marco Polo back and forth to kind of keep in contact. And this was a pretty dangerous situation too, because if we somehow became separated in the fog and out of earshot, we probably wouldn't ever find one another again. Luckily though, we were able to maintain contact by yelling at each other through the fog. And finally, one of us did find the Cairn markers again and called for us to head in that direction. So we did. And we found the rocky path, and we followed that path down the other side of the mountain to descend towards our campsite. Part of the way down, we hit a sunny spot. The weather was breaking a bit where we were, and we could warm up a little bit in the sun, and we had a snack. And this was the first point where it felt like our consciousness came back, and we could actually discuss the situation and how sketchy it had been. Before this, we were communicating pretty minimalistically, which to me is another facet of these types of mountain trips. It's important when in a group to maintain good communication and when alone to maintain your wits. But we had lost both our communication and our wits up there. Luckily though, we did all have some experience in rough conditions and we knew the basics of what to do, like the basics of sticking together, not getting separated in the fog, and stopping and thinking about where we needed to go next and what we needed to do. The sun, though, brought us back to life a bit. We looked up the mountain towards the summit, which was obscured by clouds and bad weather. I joked about heading back up since the weather might be clearing up soon, and then we all agreed that that was a bad idea. Even our friend who had been pretty gung-ho for pushing to the summit admitted that things had gotten pretty bad up there and that we probably made the best choice by heading down when we did. From here, we ended up making it back down to our campsite fairly uneventfully. I think my friends were very exhausted here. I was tired too from the exhaustion of dealing with what might have been near hypothermia. I mean, the cold takes a lot out of you, and that can't be underestimated here. And then here, we still had to pack up our bags and hike out with our heavy packs another 10 kilometers back to the parking lot. For me, I was still in fairly decent condition, at least compared to my friends, because I was in really good physical shape from doing a lot of running at this stage. I was even in the middle of training to do a half marathon, which I ended up finishing in a month and a half later in a time of about an hour and 34 minutes. But by the time we got back to our vehicles, we were all pretty beat up and exhausted from that whole experience. And from this, I learned a couple of things. I mean, first, that we had actually done some things correctly on our way down. We didn't let ourselves get separated, which would have been very easy. I, for one, wanted to hurry down a little quicker, but thought it was better that we all sticked together. It is common on a lot of mountain treks for people to move at different speeds and sort of get separated by distance. And it does seem that it is most common for separated people to get into trouble and die than people who stick together and work together. The most important lesson I learned from this trip, though, was the importance of preparation. I'd learned a hard lesson but come out of it relatively unscathed. I decided here and then that I would never let myself be so unprepared ever again. Firstly, I didn't have the proper gear or equipment, and secondly, I don't even think I ever looked at a map to actually see where we were going and the route we were taking prior to doing it. So going in, I never really knew what exactly to expect, which obviously makes it hard to prepare. So I vowed that I would always over-prepare in case of bad situations like this. One of the things I had done here was I packed a bunch of beers for us to bring to the top of the mountain to celebrate with. I think I even brought two bottles for me and one for each of my friends, and those beers were heavy. 
I would have been much better off leaving the beers behind and packing some extra layers instead, or not being stupid in the first place and having a rain jacket on hand at least, or something like that. And here, not just even for my sake, I mean, if any of us had been injured or twisted an ankle or something, we could have ended up in a really bad situation. We would have been totally exposed to the elements and to terrible weather and been stuck up there with inappropriate gear. So, in my opinion, I mean, something as simple as carrying a small emergency blanket, or even have an emergency bivy, seems like a really good idea. These days I do have one, it weighs like 10 ounces and packs up super small, so I figure that even if you never use it, something like that could one day be used to help someone else who's in trouble. And you've got to think too, I mean, we share these mountains and these trails with other people, and other people can get into trouble too. On this hike in particular, we never saw other people up there at the top of the mountain, but on lots of other hikes it's common to encounter others, and you never know if you might encounter others that are in need of some kind of help. So even if you're not packing extra things for selfish reasons, it might be good to pack extra things just in case you need to help someone else out. So, from this experience, I now have this mantra of preparation, or of over-preparation. I was never like this before this experience. And these days, it is fairly common for my wife to make fun of me a little bit for bringing too much stuff rather than just bringing the bare minimum. And don't get me wrong here, I do still pack my bag like a minimalist and try to only bring the essentials. It's just that I now have a different idea about what the essentials mean. To me, the essentials generally includes extra layers, extra food, and more than enough water. And depending on where you're going or what you're doing, it might also be a good idea to bring along some emergency matches or an emergency bivy like I sometimes do, things like that. To me, a successful hike is when you get back to your vehicle having not even needed those extra essentials that you brought with you, but knowing that you have them just in case. On the flip side, a failed hike to me is if the conditions are perfect and everything goes your way and everything goes to plan, but you use all of your layers, you eat all of your food, and you drink all of your water. In my opinion, if you make it back to your vehicle after a hike of some kind, having had perfect conditions, but you arrive back to your vehicle with nothing left over, then you kind of just tempted fate. And you'd probably be fine 99% of the time, even if something went a little bit wrong. But you wouldn't be fine every time. It's important to be aware of the unexpected. And as someone who plans to spend a lot of time in the mountains on these kinds of hikes, the likelihood is that one day I'm going to encounter a situation where I will need to utilize some of my emergency supplies. And if that's the case where those things are actually needed, then I will be very happy that I actually have them with me. So, that was my first ever mountain survival experience where things got a little bit sketchy. And I think it also was the closest call, I mean it was the closest to making a bad decision where something might have actually gone terribly wrong. Like if we had pushed to the summit and ended up developing hypothermia or something like that, that very well could have happened in those conditions. So the second experience happened a couple of years later while I was hiking in the Himalayas in India. We were staying in Dharamkot in Makhliod Gange, India, and this is at the tail end of a seven week or so trip to India that I went on with my wife. Well, at the time she was my fiance. And this location the, at Makhliod Gange is actually the residence of the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan government in exile. I did even actually see the Dalai Lama in person on this trip, from a distance, but maybe I'll talk about that on some other episode. So this hike we went on, me and my fiancé, it's one of the more popular hikes in the area. Where we were staying, we were at an elevation of about 2,000 meters, and the hike we were going on went up to an elevation of about 3,000 meters, up to a spot called the Triund. And there are two ways to get there. The primary trail is pretty heavily trafficked, and we decided, or rather I decided, to take a different trail that was more exposed and steeper, but less overall distance. It was also a more beautiful trail in my opinion because you had a better view, whereas the main trail that most people take doesn't have much of a view until you get to the top. And that main trail is also basically a path of rocks and stones all the way up. The alternative route, I reasoned, would get us to the top quicker and with more natural terrain and better views too. 
So at this point, I knew the importance of preparation. And as part of my plan, I wanted to make sure that we left pretty early in the morning, like by 8 a.m. at the latest. Every day we'd been up in Dharamkot, MacLeod Gange, there was an intense hailstorm that came through in midday between like noon and 2 p.m. And this was happening in late June. So I just figured that it would probably be smart of us to be on the top of the Trion by this time. And the hike itself would be a multi-hour affair to give us enough breathing room here. I figured leaving at around 8 a.m. would make sure we avoided any potential hailstorms. My wife, though, wasn't liking that idea. She's not much of a morning person. She preferred to leave a little bit later in the morning, after at least we had some breakfast or something. So I ended up saying that would be fine. I mean, I looked at the weather forecast, and it was supposed to be a very clear day. There's no hail or storms in the forecast. So I figured it should be fine if we left a little bit later. That was my first mistake. At breakfast, I was a bit anxious to get going and get moving, but we really took our time. We ended up not starting off on the trail until closer to 10 a.m. I think it was like 9.30 when we started towards the trailhead and 10 a.m. when we officially started up the mountain up the trail. So the trail was incredibly steep and hard going at first. We pushed on pretty slowly. After about two hours, we reached the ridge that leads up to the Trion, so we were well over halfway there. But this was also the most exposed section. And when we paused to rest, we saw gigantic black clouds rolling over the mountains above us and heading in our direction. And these were some of the last pictures that I took of us on this ledge with these sort of ominous clouds rolling in behind us. So with the weather potentially taking a turn here, we decided to push on. I still really wanted to get up to the tree end, especially before the hail came. I figured if the hail was about to come within the next half hour or hour or so, we should move quickly to get up there before that happens. As we started heading up the mountain trying to move quickly, after a few minutes we started getting some light rain. And we kept going. And then that light rain turned into a light hail. And then that light hail started getting heavier and heavier. So clearly at this point to me it looked like the hailstorm was arriving. So down further where we stayed at our hostel, the hailstorm normally lasted for like 15 to 20 minutes or so, and then it would peter out and get a lot more mild or go away altogether. It would be like a large amount of hail all at once, but then it would clear up and be sunny again. So as the hail started picking up pretty quickly, we decided we should try to take shelter beneath a rock ledge that was next to the trail. And this did work temporarily, but then water started flowing over the rock ledge and down onto us. And not all of the hail was getting blocked either. The hailstones were pretty large, some of them probably close to an inch in diameter. And I got clocked in the head by one as we were sheltering, and it hurt. Kind of dazed me a little bit. And since our little shelter spot clearly wasn't working for us, we decided at this point that we should run down the mountain and try to find a different shelter. Back where we had stopped to rest on the ridge, we remembered that we'd seen this little tiny tent slash shack kind of thing with a couple of people there looking like they were loading things up or preparing it or something. So on a lot of these Himalaya trekking trails, there are these sort of rest stops that serve as like little mini temporary tea houses. And we had seen one of these tents that kind of looked like that, and it looked like there had been some people there, so we thought maybe we should run down there and try to take shelter there, that would probably be a lot better than where we are now under this little rock. So from here we got up and we started running down the ridge. I had made sure to prepare for this trip so that we did have some light rain jackets and some extra layers and some food, but unfortunately this didn't do too much against a hailstorm like this. As we started running down the mountain trail, the storm got way more intense. It was like the most intense monsoon downpour we'd experienced elsewhere in India, but instead of water, this was hail. Some water was also coming from somewhere, though, because the trail and the hills surrounding us immediately began flooding with water, flowing all the way down these hills. Streams of water started to form where minutes before there hadn't been any sign of a stream or water there at all. I got clocked on the head a few more times with some big hailstones. I tried to hold up my hood to give a little bit of padding from the hail, but... This wasn't easy to do while also trying to navigate down this mountain path. We eventually, after a couple minutes, spotted the temporary tent shelter and we headed down in that direction. We had to cross through a stream that was up to our shins of in icy cold water and that completely soaked our shoes, though they were pretty well soaked at this point anyways. 
But this stream also didn't exist just a couple minutes before that. It was just a grassy, empty field. It had gone from this green, grassy field into a stream several meters wide and half a foot deep in the span of like 10 to 15 minutes. Once we crossed through that stream, we made it to the tent and we went inside. And there were actually two other hikers there that had just taken shelter there too. There were two local guys there that were preparing the tent for the season and told us that they weren't open yet, but that they would let us wait out the storm and they also made us some tea and served us some snacks there too. They said that they were actually preparing for the hut to open in the next week. I think they were opening in the first week of July and this was like the end of June. June is usually considered the early season when you're going trekking in the Himalayas. So here, what I expected to be like a 20-minute hailstorm ended up going on for close to an hour, and it was really intense. And rather than stopping, it simply slowed into rain. After being trapped in this tent for like an hour and the hail subsiding into rain, we decided that we should try to make our way down the path we came up and back to our hostel down the mountain. So we went and did that. On the way up, we had crossed a dry riverbed with a bunch of goats hanging out on the rocks and enjoying the sun there, and I was super worried on the way down that all of the water would essentially cut us off and form this river where we wouldn't be able to cross, essentially stranding us on the other side of that river or stream. But still, I figured that the most important thing for us to do at this point was to get lower in elevation as soon as we could. So we got to the river and it was flowing pretty good where there hadn't been a river before. But there were also some large boulders that we could hop onto and hop along to get to the other side. So we were able to do that and make it across safely. And then we went and got some hot food while soaking wet. And that was the end of that experience. It turned out after looking at a map that we had only been like a few hundred meters from the top of the Triand where there was more shelter and a full-on cafe. I had made the choice to turn around and head down the mountain out of safety concerns and seek shelter down below, but we might have actually been better off in this situation to continue on to the top because we weren't really that far away. We just didn't know how close we actually were. So for me, this experience reinforced the need for me to prepare and plan even better. I had prepared in terms of gear and I had an overall plan, but it didn't get executed properly. I had planned to leave earlier on in the morning to avoid the hailstorm, but that plan fell through, and we ended up getting stuck in the worst storm that we experienced in our entire two weeks that we spent up there. And it was also a really bad place to get stuck in a storm where we were exposed on a mountain ridge at like 2,800 meters above sea level during monsoon season in India. We did have light rain jackets on, but they didn't do much to protect us against heavy hailstones. Luckily, we were able to keep from freezing, like on my other experience in the mountains, but we were still far from successful. I got down from the mountain feeling pretty defeated. If I had planned things a little bit better and looked at maps a little bit more, I might have realized that we were actually really close to the top of the mountain and that shelter up above us was nearer than the shelter down below. And if I didn't let our timeline slide, then we would have made it well before the hailstorm came and we could have even been enjoying a hot tea with a nice view from under the comfort of a tarped cafe before making our way down with a more leisurely stroll down the main trail, which had been my original plan. So to me, this just reinforced this need for planning and execution and the need to me to step into a leadership role on these types of excursions. When out on these big mountain treks, I pride myself on being well prepared, on having a good plan, on making sure that plan stays on track, and making sure that the rest of the group, if I'm with people, is doing alright. Here, though, I had admittedly planned a grueling uphill trek that was a bit out of depth for my wife. She had to push pretty hard to do what we had done. She was perfectly capable of doing so, but this wasn't necessarily the right environment to push your limits in this regard and she did it at my urging. We would have probably been better off choosing something slightly less taxing that we could both enjoy rather than having me pushing her to do something that she didn't necessarily want to do, and doing it in such a way that when things went sideways it sort of ruined the whole experience. When you're doing something that you really enjoy doing and things go sideways, it's not such a big deal. But when you're really pushing your limit and things go sideways, then that can be a lot to overcome. 
And this is something as a leader in this type of scenario that I need to be able to recognize. That I need to be able to plan better for the abilities of the people that I'm with rather than pushing people out of their depth. So that was my takeaway with this experience. The need to prepare better, to plan better, and to also plan for contingencies. And make sure that you execute the plan correctly. So lesson number one was preparation. And lesson number two is also preparation. But for preparation part two, this also means formulating a good plan and executing that plan well. That's part of the preparation. And now we go on to lesson number three. So my third sketchy experience in the mountains happened while I was alone in Iceland on a hike up to a large glacier. On this particular trek, I planned and prepared for it pretty much perfectly from start to finish. It was an 18-kilometer round-trip trek with close to 1,000 meters in elevation gain up to a big mountain that looked out over onto a gigantic glacier. It's also one of the coolest and the best hikes that I've ever done to this day. So I had planned to finish this round trip in about six hours, which was a little fast, but I figured that I could make that work if I started nice and early. I figured I should be at the top by about three hours and 30 minutes into the hike at the latest, and expect that it would take me two plus hours heading down because I also planned to run a portion of the return trip. So this entire hike was absolutely beautiful. I saw glaciers and glacial waterfalls coming off of glaciers, and the terrain was incredible. I, I could see what, for what must have been tens of kilometers off in the distance. The mountain portion itself was incredibly steep and involved scrambling over loose shale rock, and that was actually pretty sketchy. Once I got up into this mountain area, the trail was no longer well marked. You kind of had to follow these cairns, these rock piles, so that you could see the route you needed to take. There was a benefit, though, to this sort of loose shale scrambling in that you could sort of forge your own route to go up. You didn't necessarily have to follow the rock piles that marked the trail. You could kind of, you could easily see the summit from where you were, and then you could kind of pick out the way you wanted to go to get there up this loose rock. So this let you do a little bit of interpretive scrambling to make your own way up to the summit. Some parts here were super steep with loose shale that slid down the mountain when you stepped on it, though, so you did have to watch your step and be aware of where you were going. So I got to the summit here in about 3 hours and 15 minutes from when I started the hike, so pretty much right on schedule. After spending some time up there to have a snack and rehydrate and take a bunch of pictures, I started on my way down. But I immediately lost the trail on the way down. I think the cairns, the rock piles on the way up were easy to, easy to spot, but they were also placed in ways that made them hard to see going down. Like, they'd be placed in front of a boulder when going up, but on the way down, the cairn is now behind the boulder, so you can't really tell what the right path is. And because I had taken such an interpretive scramble on the way up and all of the rocks sort of look the same, there really isn't any well-defined path at all. I couldn't even retrace my steps because I didn't know exactly which way I had come. After doing some trail hunting, I figured the most important thing was to just make my way back down so that I could find the main trail leading off of the mountain, no matter how I ended up getting there. Following the Karen markers here didn't really matter as long as I could find the footpath that led down the mountain anyways. So with that in mind, and then having GPS on my phone where I could see the footpath on the map and see my location on the GPS, I set out towards the path. I ended up venturing way too far down the side of the mountain and towards this big cliff, this big drop-off that basically dropped straight off to a glacier. The mountain here was basically a pile of loose shale rock and then at some point just a straight drop off with a straight cliff wall. So the shale is always sliding down the mountain and over this cliff. So I realized as I was making my way further down the mountain that I was getting closer and closer to this sort of cliff drop off. And just when every time I stepped, more loose shale or small pebbles would roll out from under me and past me and down the mountainside. This was sort of causing these mini shale landslides as I went along. And like I said, at the bottom of this big drop-off below me was this gigantic glacier. So looking down the mountain and the way that I was going, I saw this pile of rocks, and then the pile of rocks ended, and then there was this gigantic wall of jagged ice below me. 
So it was a pretty ominous thing to be looking at for someone that wasn't on any marked path or trail at this point. Since I was a little bit lost, my instinct to just go down the mountain and find my way down had gotten me a little bit frantic. And here I also really wanted to stick to my timeline, so that sort of pushed me to keep on going and frantically looking for the trail that I could take down the mountain. At some point while precariously moving down this loose rock, I thought to myself, I thought, Okay, so the way things are going, am I about to cause a landslide of shale rocks here that's going to sweep me down the mountain and down onto the glacier way down below? Because that would definitely be a 100% fatal one-way trip. I stopped here for a moment and I realized that I had been starting to panic a bit, and I'd been acting a little bit out of panic. I'd been heading down faster and faster wanting to get to what I thought was safety down below. But in doing so, I'd been heading in the wrong direction, going too far down the mountain on this loose rock, and I missed the trail entirely. Because I was going down so fast, I was also sort of jumping and lunging from one rocky outcrop to another. I didn't even slow down to look for cairns. I was just blindly heading down the mountain, not even going in the right direction. So luckily, I caught myself here. I caught myself in this frantic, almost panic-like mode, and I made myself stop and breathe. So I took some breaths, and I took some time to think. I looked at my GPS and realized that it wasn't accurate enough to be trusted. And I realized that I needed to head back up the mountain that I just came down and look for the proper trail markers so that I could find the actual trail. I also reprimanded myself a bit here. I knew full well the dangers of panicking in these situations, and by nature I'm usually very calm under this kind of pressure. But here I had lost the plot and had become a little bit frantic and was frankly being a bit reckless. Tipped off by the fact here that I actually questioned if I was going to make it out alive or not. And how stupid, I thought, if I did die in this situation, rushing down this mountainside in the wrong direction and falling over a cliff and down onto a gigantic glacier where I might never be found. So after taking some time to reprimand myself a bit, I sort of got my wits back about me. I started working my way back up the mountainside, which was actually super difficult because of all the loose shale that I'd just kind of been sliding down the last couple minutes. And there were a couple spots here where it almost seemed like I might be stuck and started to get a little bit frantic again. But again, I had to catch myself and calm down and work my way out of these difficult spots. Eventually, I saw a tiny little cairn way up above me on a rocky sort of vein running down the mountainside. So I knew that the trail must be somewhere to the left of me, behind this rocky vein. I figured I could either go scrambling all the way up and follow that cairn, or try slipping around the rocky vein around to my left and hopefully end up at or near the trail leading down the mountain. It was a bit precarious, but I managed to slip around this rocky vein, and on the other side I soon found the well-trodden footpath that headed back down the mountain. I ended up making it all the way back to the start of the trailhead successfully and without any more issues. So the lesson I learned from this one is that of remaining calm and collected in the mountains. Even having good preparation and planning isn't necessarily enough if your plan goes to hell, which can happen quickly if you're not paying attention. And in this case, when I wasn't able to stick to the trail, I started to get a little bit frantic. I started going quicker, heading in whichever direction I thought might take me down the mountain. And as I sped up, I got more lost. I began losing my cool. I began panicking a little bit. Luckily, though, I caught myself and I was able to correct. But I could clearly see that this type of thing was easy to do, easy to lose yourself in panic. And when you panic, you start moving faster and you make more mistakes. You burn yourself out. And you get yourself into a worse situation. I had done this type of thing before, just on a much lesser scale. This was my most dangerous experience with this type of thing. And it also shows that doing these types of treks solo can be inherently more dangerous because you don't have that group dynamic to keep you in check. It's more of a mental battle with yourself here. You have to know how to stay in control. So, ultimately, these are my three lessons. Preparation, preparation, and staying calm. If you're well prepared and you have a good plan, and you're able to stay calm and stick to your plan, then you are very likely to come out alive and perfectly okay. 
Part of the preparation also means preparing for the worst, expecting the unexpected. Part of the planning means having contingencies and backup plans. And part of staying calm means knowing that you're likely to go through moments where it does seem like the plan is falling apart, and that when you do have these moments, you need to give your brain the time it needs to figure out a solution. And to give yourself that time, that means you need to stay calm and slow down. If you get frantic and speed things up, then your brain has even less time to think, less time to solve the problem. And there are an awful lot of scenarios in the mountains where making a bad choice can get you into trouble really quickly. I do think that these types of mountain experiences also do something to you. They bring you into the fold. You sort of become a part of the mountain, and the mountain becomes a part of you. There's a book I've been reading lately, it's called Mountains of the Mind, and it's by writer and mountaineer Robert McFarlane. And in this book, McFarlane sort of describes how he fell in love with the mountains and with mountaineering. At one point he says, and I quote, I was attracted by the bleakness of the places these men got to, the parsimony of the landscapes of mountain and pole, with their austere color scheme of black and white. The human values in the stories were polarized, too. Bravery and cowardice, rest and exertion, danger and safety, right and wrong. The unforgiving nature of the environment sorted everything into these neat binaries. I wanted my life to be this clear in its lines, this simple in its priorities. So here, McFarlane is describing how he came across these stories of mountaineers and adventurers and explorers as a kid and read about these stories in books. And it was through these encounters in the books and reading these stories of adventure that he found his passion for spending time in the mountains and enduring these kinds of hardships. McFarlane goes on, and I quote, They seemed to me then the ideal travelers, unfazed by adversity and unassuming in person. I longed to be like them. McFarlane also talks about this legendary mountaineer named Maurice Herzog and his account of climbing one of the most dangerous 8,000-meter peaks in the world, Annapurna. In 1950, Herzog led the first expedition to reach the summit of Annapurna. And Annapurna has the highest fatality rate of any of the 8,000-meter peaks in the Himalayas. A higher fatality rate than Mount Everest and higher than K2. McFarlane here describes Herzog's experience on going for the summit of Annapurna, being the first to summit that mountain. He says, and I quote, In his account of the climb, Herzog describes becoming progressively more detached from what was happening to him, the clarity and thinness of the air, the crystalline beauty of the mountains, and the strange painlessness of frostbite conspired to send him into a state of numbed serenity, which made him insensitive to his worsening injuries. Here, McFarlane quotes Herzog himself, who says, and I quote, There was something unusual in the way I saw everything around us. I smiled to myself at the paltriness of our efforts, but all sense of exertion was gone, as though there were no longer any gravity. This diaphanous landscape, this quintessence of purity, these were not the mountains I knew. They were the mountains of my dreams. So this to me is a really interesting description of one's suffering on the most dangerous of mountains. It's an almost spiritual experience. At least that's how I would kind of look at my own mountain experiences. They have this spiritual element to them, as if the landscape itself is a living being. It can welcome you in and give you safe passage, or it can completely destroy you. And I mean, this does anthropomorphize mountains and gives them these sort of human attributes, but this is a perspective that's existed in human societies for a very long time. The idea that the mountains themselves are alive. And among the Nepalese and the Tibetans themselves, they consider the mountains to be gods. McFarlane also goes on to talk about this significance that we give to mountains. The mountains themselves are just these objects made up of rock, but we sort of give them personality and importance. He says, and I quote, What we call a mountain is thus in fact a collaboration of the physical forms of the world with the imagination of humans, a mountain of the mind. 
and the way people behave towards mountains has little or nothing to do with the actual objects of rock and ice themselves. Mountains are only contingencies of geology. They do not kill deliberately, nor do they deliberately please. Any emotional properties which they possess are vested in them by human imaginations. But they are also the products of human perception. They have been imagined into existence. So this is the question, why do we go into the mountains? Why do we climb them? Why do they cast these spells over us? I can't help when looking up at any mountain to imagine what it would be like to be up there, climbing it, moving along the ridge, heading for the summit on a beautiful clear day. In the words of the great naturalist and author John Muir, the mountains are calling and I must go. Also, George Mallory in his infamous attempt to summit Everest in 1924, that attempt that would later kill him, he wrote to his wife before his death saying, and I quote, Everest has the most steep ridges and appalling precipices that I have ever seen, my darling. I can't tell you how it possesses me. Now maybe we can call this mountain fever or summit fever, this unstoppable drive to reach the peak that seems to also call people to their deaths. In his book Into Thin Air, writer and mountaineer John Krakauer describes his journey on the fateful 1996 Everest disaster that led to the deaths of eight climbers within 24 hours. Krakauer says about climber Doug Hansen, and I quote, This was Doug's second shot at Everest with Rob Hall. The year before, Rob had forced him and three other clients to turn back just 330 feet below the top because the hour was late and the summit ridge was buried beneath a mantle of deep, unstable snow. The summit looked so close, Doug recalled with a painful laugh. Believe me, there hasn't been a day since that I haven't thought about it. He'd been talked into returning this year by Hall, who felt sorry that Hansen had been denied the summit and had significantly discounted Hansen's fee to entice him to give it another try. End quote. Doug would later die on this second summit attempt, along with his experienced Everest guide Rob Hall. Now, I am not like Doug. (laughs) Failed attempts do not haunt me. To me, there is little to no difference between climbing to, say, 8,700 meters on Mount Everest or climbing to, say, 8,800 meters on Mount Everest. I care about the experience itself. The experience of being that high up on Everest would be pretty much identical regardless of whether or not you step foot on the actual summit of the mountain. Now, I love spending time in the mountains, and I love climbing mountains or hiking up mountains, but I cannot compare my affliction to that of Maurice Herzog, who summited Annapurna, or George Mallory, who died on Everest, or Doug Hansen, who also died on Everest. I'm intrigued by mountains, I sometimes daydream about mountains, and I enjoy spending time in and on the mountains, but I'm also risk-adverse. I love nothing more than planning a hike up to a beautiful peak with minimal risks involved. And the reason I point out these three incidents that I've experienced is that they still haunt me in some way. I still kick myself over them. Not because I didn't reach the summit, but because of what I did wrong. I do sometimes obsess over future mountain expeditions, but I also obsess equally over past failures or mistakes. I guess you could call me a bit of a mountain perfectionist or something. The important thing to me is making it back alive, more so than making it to the summit. The summit is this arbitrary thing. It's a human construct. The summit is only meaningful because we give it meaning. Life, on the other hand, is meaningful because we exist. Because we're alive. Life has more inherent meaning than any summit ever could. And for that reason, I don't think it's worth risking your life for a summit. To me, the greatest adventure story of all time is that of Ernest Shackleton's failed expedition to the South Pole. And it's the greatest story of all time because he didn't die, and he didn't lose all of his crew like some other expeditions to the South Pole did. In January of 1915, Ernest Shackleton's ship, titled The Endurance, became trapped in sea ice off the shore of Antarctica. 
After over nine months being trapped in the sea ice, the crew was forced to abandon ship in October, when the ship itself, Endurance, was crushed by the sea ice and dragged beneath the ocean. As a result, Shackleton and his crew had to make camp on the sea ice itself. Eventually, they began dragging their lifeboats, their wooden lifeboats, across the sea ice, dragging them for several hundred kilometers over many months. In April of 1916, after having been stranded on ice or in ice for some 15 months in total, they reached the open sea and they were able to launch their lifeboats and navigate them to a small island off the Antarctic coast, the first dry land they'd seen in all of that time. They landed on a tiny little island called Elephant Island in the South Atlantic. Within a few days and after some much-needed repairs, Shackleton took one of their lifeboats, the 22-foot-long James Caird, and launched this tiny wooden craft into the ferocious South Atlantic, where the most inhospitable seas on the entire planet are. Shackleton and a handful of his crew rowed and sailed and navigated across 1,300 kilometers of open ocean before hitting their mark and landing on another island that had an active whaling station on it. And all of this happened as winter in the southern hemisphere was quickly approaching. Because their wooden lifeboat was so small and damaged, they, have a, they had a hard time even just landing on the shore of this other island called South Georgia Island. And when they landed, because the island is still dozens of kilometers long, they were still a ways away from the whaling station, and they were completely unable to navigate the seas around the island with their tiny boat. So, Shackleton took two other men, and they hiked across the never-before-crossed interior of the island, crossing over frozen peaks, and arriving eventually on the other side after two days to safety at this whaling station on the other side of the island. The majority of the ship's crew had been left behind on Elephant Island some 1,300 kilometers away a couple weeks before. It ended up taking Shackleton three tries using larger, borrowed ships until he eventually made his way back to Elephant Island to rescue his crew after three months of having left them there to go seek help. So, in August of 1916, 19 months after having their original ship, the Endurance, get locked up in sea ice, and 10 months after having abandoned their ship and set up camp on drifting sea ice, Shackleton's crew was officially rescued. Stunningly, he did not lose a single member of his crew. All 27 of them survived this crazy experience. So it is kind of telling, in a way, that the name of the ship that they set out on was called the Endurance, and Shackleton chose that name for the vessel on purpose. I mean, the feat that Shackleton and his crew endured was a matter of endurance to a remarkable level. Funnily enough, this past week, the wreckage of the Endurance was actually found. They've looked for it before, but because of the extreme cold and the ice and the depths, they've never found it. But today, in 2022, after more than 100 years, they found the wooden ship, the Endurance. It's resting at a depth of 3,000 meters at the bottom of the ocean, and apparently it's in pretty good condition still. It's been well-preserved. I mean, I wouldn't expect anything less of a ship called the Endurance. And you can see pictures and videos of it online. They just discovered this a week or so ago. And to me, this incredible story is more significant than stories of people who reached the South Pole and died on their return trip, or people who reached some huge summit and didn't make their way back down, ended up dying after reaching the summit. That happens fairly frequently. I think it's strange that we put so much glory in this idea of reaching this summit or reaching this target, and that takes all of the glory instead of this idea of enduring this incredible hardship and surviving. To me, Shackleton's experience of having survived being trapped in sea ice and having his ship crushed and sunk beneath the waves and then surviving by escaping the sea ice on their tiny little wooden rescue boats or lifeboats this is, to me, a far more significant feat than some of his contemporaries who reached the South Pole. Shackleton, in some ways, outdid those people, despite having not stepped foot on Antarctica in this particular expedition. 
And how was this feat of endurance accomplished? Well, I think it was through the impeccable leadership of Ernest Shackleton who guided his crew through this incredible situation. When they were forced to abandon their ship and set up camp on the ice, Shackleton then realized that their only hope would be to pull their heavy wooden lifeboats and equipment hundreds of kilometers across the ice until they could eventually, hopefully, reach the open sea, where they could then make a break for it and make a break for one of these other islands that were out there. In the book Endurance, Shackleton's Incredible Voyage, written by Alfred Lansing, the author discusses Shackleton's incredible leadership abilities. After their ship is crushed by the ice and falls beneath the sea, the author describes what happens next. He says, and I quote, Shackleton called all hands together into the center of the circle of the tents. His face was grave. He explained it was imperative that all weight be reduced to the barest minimum. Each man, he said, would be allowed the clothes on his back, plus two pairs of mittens, six pairs of socks, two pairs of boots, a sleeping bag, a pound of tobacco, and two pounds of personal gear. Speaking with the utmost conviction, Shackleton pointed out that no article was of any value when weighed against their ultimate survival, and he exhorted them to be ruthless in ridding themselves of every unnecessary ounce, regardless of its value. After he had spoken, he reached under his parka and took out a gold cigarette case and several gold sovereigns and threw them into the snow at his feet. Then he opened the Bible Queen Alexandria had given them and ripped out the flyleaf and the page containing the 23rd palm. He also tore out the page from the book of Job with this verse on it. Quoting from the Bible, Out of whose womb came the ice? and the hoary frost of heaven, who hath gendered it? The waters are hid as with a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. End quote. Then he laid the Bible in the snow and walked away. It was a dramatic gesture, but that was the way Shackleton wanted it. From studying the outcome of past expeditions, he believed that those that burdened themselves with equipment to meet every contingency had fared much worse than those that had sacrificed total preparedness for speed. Of course, though, it wasn't all serious business. There was also a need to keep the spirits of the crew up. Lansing goes on, and I quote, One crew member actually was ordered to take his zither banjo along, even though it weighed 12 pounds. It was lashed in its case under the bow sheets of the whaler to keep it out of the weather. So here, obviously, we're talking about Shackleton's perceived need to keep the crew a tight-knit bunch of people. Despite his speech about leaving behind anything that wasn't absolutely necessary, Shackleton actually ordered one of his men to bring along his banjo. In this regard, it seems like having something to keep the men occupied and together and in good spirits was more important than just the considerations of weight alone. Shackleton also had a legendary ability to remain optimistic and to keep his crew in good spirits, and he spent a lot of time and effort ensuring that the crew remained a tight-knit group. This was probably essential to their ability to survive without, lin without losing a single member of their crew. Lansing goes on, and I quote, Though he was virtually fearless in the physical sense, he, Shackleton, suffered an almost pathological dread of losing control of the situation. In part, this attitude grew out of a consuming sense of responsibility. He felt he had gotten them into their situation, and it was his responsibility to get them out. As a consequence, he was intensely watchful for potential troublemakers who might nibble away at the unity of the group. Shackleton felt that if dissension arose, the party as a whole might not put forth that added ounce of energy which could mean, at a time of crisis, the difference between survival and defeat. Thus, he was prepared to go to almost any length to keep the party close-knit and under his control. Shackleton was also an incredible decision-maker, able to make good, bold decisions when necessary. When he left his crew back on Elephant Island to make a run for South Georgia across the open sea, he purposely chose a couple of crew members to join him that were known dissenters, known troublemakers. His reasoning that because he was leaving behind the majority of his crew, I think he left behind 
23 people and only brought four with him. His reasoning was that on his tiny craft, he could keep these people in line, whereas if he left them back with the main group, they could cause a lot of trouble. They could cause problems and potentially even lessen the group's chances of survival. To avoid that, he just brought these troublemakers with him and gave them an important role. He was also an impeccable planner, and this was the foundation of Shackleton's abilities. He was always poring over charts and maps and trying to figure out various escape routes and options that might bring them to safety if or when this sea ice might break up and they might get their chance. And when the opportunity finally did come, he pounced on it very quickly. I mean, these open sea journeys that they embarked on weren't ideal, but they were the best options that they had available to them at the time, when the ice did break and when they did have open seas. To me, these are some of the essential elements of any survival situation. The ability to prepare and to plan meticulously. To take decisive action when necessary. And to foster group cooperation. Everyone needs to be on the same page and working together. On my first survival experience when we seemed to be approaching hypothermia, it was my lack of preparation that got me into a bad situation. But it was my decision to begin heading down that led to a safe return, and it was also a factor of good group dynamics with the people that I was with. In my second experience, the preparation was great, but the executing of the plan fell short. But good decisions here got us down safely. We were able to push through when things got tough and sketchy and make our way down. The third experience where I was alone, preparation and planning was on point. But decision making did get compromised a little bit. I didn't have any team to worry about that might have grounded me and I needed to self-regulate and take a step back to think about what I was doing. So the group dynamics element is a difficult one to contend with, but surviving through hardship in a group setting seems more likely than in an individual setting. I mean, Shackleton was a master of managing groups of people, and surely nobody would have survived alone what Shackleton and his crew were able to survive by working together. Then again, people in leadership positions making bad decisions can also lead to catastrophe. Like what happened on the 1996 Everest disaster, where expedition leader Rob Hall urged his group to the top of Everest, well past the predetermined turnaround time, so they continued to the top, well after the time when they should have been turning around. And this decision to continue up against one's better judgment, I mean, this led to the deaths of two of his clients, as well as the death of himself and another guide on his expedition. Had everyone just turned around by the agreed-upon time, it's unlikely that any of them would have died. Had they just been able to step back and look at the bigger picture of things, they might have turned themselves around knowing that they were in a bad spot. But then again, some people just seem to have that summit fever where they want to reach the summit at any cost. And this gets back to what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about mountains and the allure of mountains and Wonder why we feel this need to conquer or summit these mountains. We might call this the philosophy of mountains. I don't know if there's a good term for it. But there is something uniquely human here. There's something that pushes us to do these things that we don't have to do. I mean, every story I've told here has been about a leisurely activity that people chose to embark on. I myself, on these three mountain experiences that almost went bad... I chose to go on all three of them. None of them were out of necessity. All three of these treks were because I thought it would be fun, and it was, for the most part, fun. The 1996 Everest disaster was a bunch of people that wanted to get to the summit of Everest at all costs, and they took unnecessary risks to try to make that happen. They opted to do that. Shackleton's expedition to the South Pole, he he was trying to be the first person to get to the South Pole and his expedition went completely sideways. He didn't even land on Antarctica and ended up spending a year and a half fighting for survival against the elements. The funny thing about this is that all of these goals are just these arbitrary things. Reaching the summit or reaching the South Pole or reaching any of these arbitrary goals that have to do with conquering the environment or conquering a mountain or conquering nature, they're entirely arbitrary. They're invented. We don't physically gain anything by accomplishing these things. 
The only real benefit is psychological, this feeling of accomplishment, of having done something that was incredibly difficult. And maybe that is what the philosophy of mountains is all about. It's about overcoming difficult obstacles, doing difficult things. I mean, as humans, as embodied humans in this world, our brains are wired to solve hard problems. In many ways, we thrive in these environments where we have to put our problem-solving skills to the test. That's the niche we fill in nature. It's what we're built to do. We have these big brains so that we can solve complicated and difficult problems. It just so happens that some of the most complicated and difficult problems we can possibly face have to do with exploring great mountain peaks or exploring harsh and difficult environments like on these expeditions to the South Pole. There is a certain duality to us as human beings. We are rational beings, we are bodies, and we are minds. And perhaps that is the allure of things like mountaineering. Being in the mountains, being on the mountains, pushing for the summit, it challenges the body, but more than anything, it also challenges the mind. To do so safely requires our utmost commitment and our utmost focus. And it's through this experience that we might find meaning or purpose in our lives. We might feel most alive in these situations. I, for one, though, think it's important to detach this feeling from this urge to reach the summit or this feeling that summiting is the most important thing. What's truly most important is this sort of pseudo-spiritual experience that we can have on the mountaintops and when enduring these other sorts of hardships that we challenge ourselves with. So, next time you are in the mountains, or on the mountains, or pushing towards the summit, try to remember this, that the summit is not the most important thing. The most important thing is the experience that you have, the experience that you're having up there. And more important than the summit is making it back down alive. Because when you make it back down alive, you get to live another day. You get to try and summit another day. If the mountains have taught me anything, it's that dying up there is easy and staying alive is hard. So I say we focus on that. Focus on staying alive. The summit is just this arbitrary construct. If you really think about it objectively, the summit doesn't really mean anything. Life, on the other hand, is all we've really got in this world. Life means everything. And life is what we should be focusing on, not summits. So with that, I'm going to end things there. Thank you everyone for listening, and I will see you all in the next one.